Hello, good morning, everyone. So I hope uh, you are all safe and sound at home. Uh, so let me uh, share what uh, I have uploaded to the LMS. Uh, now I have uploaded three things for this week. One is the lesson three uh, slides. And then there is one assignment for you to do this week. And there's the note about this Zoom meeting. Right. So hopefully others will be able to watch this later. I will share the slides or the, the recording into the LMS later on. Okay, so let's start the lesson. So let me first uh, add this file. Okay. Now I think you can see the slide. Uh, so this is, uh, in this lesson, we are going to cover the basic concepts of architecture and design. So uh, first, uh, let's get through some definitions. So in the second slide, uh, we have the topic, what is software architecture? So I hope you are following this uh, in the slides as well. So the definition uh, that we are supposed to learn is that it's a software systems architecture is the set of principal design decisions about the system. So principal here is like the principal of a school. Okay, so notice the spellings there. So what is principal? It means that is the most important, right? So software architecture is kind of like the blueprint or the plan for a software systems construction and evolution. And these design decisions encompass every facet of the system under development. So we can look at it from different angles and look at, look at it from structural point of view. Like what are the systems that make up our software? And the behavior, how does this software behave when the user does something, when the user interacts or when a uh, method is passed, right? Uh, then interactions, again, uh, how the different components work with each other. And then comes the non-functional properties, so derived from the non-functional requirements of the software. So all these things affect the design decisions. So principle implies a degree of importance that grants a design decision the architectural status. So that means not all design decisions are architectural, right? So here principle is meaning that it's more important, right? So only the most important design decisions get into the architectural diagrams. So it implies that not all design decisions are architectural and they do not necessarily impact the system's architecture. So small, small design decisions will not affect the whole architecture. So if you decide to have a client server architecture, right, because of the non-functional requirements of your system, right, then some a small functional requirement might require you to change something, but it will not change the architectural decision that you have taken to make it a client server uh, system. So how one defines principle will depend on what the stakeholders define as the system goals. So here we have to be aware of the business goals because in the uh, last weeks, uh, Listen, we looked at the architectures in context, and uh, then there was that reading you had to do, where we try to link the business goals to the 
architectural decisions. So it's very important that you identify in the real world projects what the stakeholders perceive as important. Then uh, there are other definitions of software architecture taken from different textbooks. We have sorry. So we I'm now in the fourth slide. Okay, referring to other definitions of software architecture. So Perry and Wolf suggest that software architecture is made up of elements form and rationale, meaning elements make up what the software is made up of and form describes how the software is implemented and there's a rationale why we do it that way. Right? So all those things make up the architecture of the software. Then Shaw and Garlem says that software architecture is a level of design that involves the description of elements from which systems are built and interactions among those elements, patterns that guide their composition and constraints on these patterns. And Christian's book suggests software architecture deals with the design and implementation of the high level structure of software and architecture deals with abstraction, decomposition, composition, style, and aesthetics. Right. Then uh, going to the fifth slide, this temporal aspect. What's temporal? It's like time methods, there's a timeline. So does the architecture change with time? Yes. So as we make design decisions, the architecture gets changed. So the initial design decisions might get changed later on. So meaning the architecture changes with time. So design decisions are made and unmade over a system's lifetime, resulting in architecture having a temporal aspect. So when you are referring to the architecture, you have to specify at what time. Right? Is it the current architecture? Is it the initial architecture? Or is it the final architecture of a project? So at any given point in time, the system has only one architecture. So at a time t, there's only one architecture. And the system's architecture will change over time. Okay, then uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we have prescriptive architectures as well as descriptive architectures. So systems prescriptive architecture captures the design decisions made prior to the system's construction. So it's like prescription you get from a doctor, right? So you go see a doctor, you, we call, or the doctor prescribes, right? He prescribes some medicine, right? So it is a, uh, without knowing the result, we uh, prescribe things. So the prescriptive architecture is like that. So at the beginning of the uh, software project, the software architect will prescribe that this is the plan. So it is the as conceived or as intended architecture. It is a real plan at the beginning. Okay. Then a uh, system's descriptive architecture describes how the system has been built. So while you are developing the system, the architecture can get amended. So that kind of architecture that describes what is actually being built is known as a descriptive architecture. So it is the as implemented. Okay, it describes everything as implemented. So not just the initial plan. Uh, so it is also known as the as realized architecture. So sometimes certain design decisions have to be amended due to practical reasons. So there might be differences between the as intended architecture and the as realized architecture. So it's important that you we like recognize the difference between the prescriptive and the descriptive architectures. Then moving on to the next slide 
as an example when as designed versus as implemented architecture in the figure. So we have a figure about a clock, right? So if you notice the uh, diagram there, the UML diagram that describes how these uh, components interact to show the uh, system. So then uh, on the next slide, we have the as implemented architecture. Right, so if we study the two, there are small differences, right? So, so what are the differences between the two figures? So in this uh, example that shows the uh, shows cargo route routing, right? So we have a few uh, components. We have the clock that starts our system. Then there's a warehouse, uh, the cargo router and there's a graphics commun uh, connection and graphics binding so all these components we don't have to like know all the details here but uh, like there are some design uh, decisions that get changed later on so because of these uh, like uh, differences in the implementation right there are there is a mismatch between the as designed and the as implemented architectures so what is a, what can you say about these differences so is there a correct architecture is it the as designed that is correct or is it the as implemented right so uh, so as we are limited by the practicality, as implemented architecture is what describes the final system. But it's important to have a as designed architecture as well, because without that initial plan, you will not be able to formulate your design decisions. So which architecture is correct? Okay, both are correct, because they are both describing two different things. Right. And then are the two architectures consistent with one another? They do not have to be consistent, right? Because the as implemented architecture could be different from the as designed architecture due to practical reasons. Then what criteria are used to establish the consistency between the two architectures? So we have to be careful. You cannot just make any change to the as designed architecture. Right, we have to like weigh the impact because if you make a very big change, it might affect the whole as designed architecture as well. Right, then on what information is the answer to the preceding questions based? Right, so we have to be aware of what the stakeholders really want, especially the non functional requirements. So identify those important non-functional requirements and you have to make sure that those non-functional requirements are met correctly. Okay. Then uh, moving on to the 10th slide. 
we talk about the architectural evolution. So when a system evolves, ideally its prescriptive architecture is modified first, right? So when you are developing, as you're developing the system, the uh, prescriptive architecture gets changed initially, right? Then in practice, the system and thus the descriptive architecture is often directly modified. So in practice means like once the system is in use, it's descriptive architecture, which is the as implemented architecture is again changed when change is required, right? When changes are done to the system, the descriptive architecture also gets changed. So this happens because of developer sloppiness sometimes. The developer is not uh, doing the exact thing described in the architecture. So then you have to go back and change the architecture. Then perception of short deadlines which prevent thinking through and documenting. Sometimes you don't keep all the documentation up to date. So you only find that the final system is different from the architectural documents that you have. So you have to update the descriptive architecture to make sure that it matches the, the final implemented system. Then the lack of documented prescriptive architecture can sometimes cause changes to the architectural documents as well. So when you don't have a plan, a proper plan or the blueprints, which is the prescriptive architecture, then later on you will have to make up all the documents. Then a need or desire for code optimization. So sometimes you need to optimize the code uh, to improve the performance. So in that case, sometimes architectural decisions might be changed. Right? So we call that kind of changes architectural evolution. Then uh, sometimes we have inadequate techniques or tool support. You don't have all the tools or diagrams needed to uh, showcase or document the architectural decisions that you have taken. So in that case also, the architecture that you start with will not be the one that you have, you have implemented. Okay, so with these, now I'm in uh, slide number 11. Uh, we have this concept of architectural degradation. Okay, what is degradation? Meaning that you degrade or like, the quality goes down. Okay, it's like wearing out or it is uh, related to the architectural drift or, and the architectural erosion. So let's first look at what is architectural drift. So architectural drift is the introduction of principal design decisions into a system's descriptive architecture that are not included in, encompassed by or implied by the prescriptive architecture. Now we have the original blueprint for our software, which is the prescriptive architecture. Now we said that we can make changes to the prescriptive architecture and end up with a descriptive architecture, but it is not always good to make these changes to the prescriptive architecture. So when, when the prescriptive architecture is being changed and it gets amended, we call it architectural drift. Uh, and uh, But we do not violate any of the prescriptive architecture's design decisions. So it's important to identify that here in architectural drift, you are not supposed to violate any of the uh, design decisions prescribed in the prescriptive architecture. So any of the design decisions drawn in the initial blueprint is not violated, but it uh, kind of uh, the small decisions get changed, right? So things are added, right? that are not in the original plan. 
and then uh, things that are not implied in the original plan get incorporated into the descriptive architecture. So these small changes make a drift in the, the original architectural model. Then architectural erosion is another concept. So this erosion, as you know, like soil gets eroded, like after rain, like some soil might get dislocated. So like that, architectural erosion is the introduction of architectural design decisions into systems descriptive architecture that violates its prescriptive architecture. Now, in the architectural drift, we did not violate the initial design decisions that you take in the and document in the prescriptive architecture. But in architectural erosion, we introduce major changes. Okay, major design changes are introduced and they get uh, documented in the descriptive architecture. Right? So that's the main difference between architectural drift and erosion. Then we have the concept of architectural recovery. So when these kind of changes happen, sometimes we are able to mitigate these changes. So if architectural degradation is allowed to occur, right? So if we allow the quality of the architectural uh, models to change, right? Through either erosion or drift, right? So both change the architecture but then erosion is a bigger change right so anyway if you allow it to occur one will be forced to recover the system's architecture sooner or later so because of these changes happening at some point of the project you will have to recover what is the correct architecture of the system so this architectural recovery is the process of determining a software system's architecture from its implementation level artifacts. So this results when you don't keep the proper records of the architectural decisions. So if you keep on changing, keep on eroding the uh, prescribed architectures, at one point you are not sure what is the correct descriptive architecture. So at that point you had to go through all the components, look at all the small, small design decisions that you have taken and try to recover what is the current state of the software architecture. So then these artifacts that provide the uh, evidence are the source code. So if it's Java or C++ or C Sharp, you have to look at the source code and identify how are the classes arranged, how, how are the methods interacting, right? All the communications, and then the executable files, you have to go through the exe files and uh, look at the class structures by looking at the, uh, say in Java, the dot class files as well. So if we look at the timeline, so these uh, changes will affect the whole architecture. So on uh, slide 13, there's an example. So if you zoom in on this figure on slide 13, you'll see that in a project, initially start and then various design decisions are taken. And at the end, you only you recover. So after recovering, then you find what is the correct architecture of the of that particular project. Okay. Uh, then uh, on slide 14, we have the implementation level view of an application. 
So at implement, implementation level, you have like the practical situation, what you have implemented, right? And uh, so you see that it's very complex and it's kind of incomprehensible, right? So at this point of magnification, we don't really see much. So like recovering architecture from all these uh, documents, right? The class files, the executable files, and the source code is a very time consuming task. Then on uh, slide 15, we talk about the deployment, right? So deployment means that we go and install our software in the client system, right? So software system cannot fulfill its purpose until it is deployed, right? So all the executable modules are physically placed on the hardware devices on which they are supposed to run. And then the deployment view of an architecture can be critical in assessing whether the system will be able to satisfy its requirements. So especially the non-functional requirements. We, are, we don't know whether the client's non-functional requirements are correctly satisfied until we really go and deploy the system and test, do the user testing, right? So there are three possible assessment dimensions, right? So first one is the available memory. So sometimes the developers use very high-end systems, high-end computers to develop and don't really think about the client's memory availability, right? So that's sometimes a problem. And then the second one is the power consumption. So if the client has some restricted power in their operating environment, or if the voltage is different, we have to be aware of that at the time of deployment. And then the required network bandwidth. So if there are a lot of network communications happening in a, say in a distributed system, right, with IoT and everything, and if the client's network does not support uh, that level of uh, performance, say if the bandwidth is low, then the performance that you plan to have will not be there, right? So we have to test all these things at the time of deployment. So at the time of deployment, we have to look at the architecture from a different perspective. So it's not the design perspective, now it is a deployment. When you are deploying, you have to clearly have what should be deployed where, right? So some part of the software may get installed on the server, some software will get installed on the client side, and there might be like small, small uh, things that need to be set up in the hardware. So, so all these, the activities or the processes will need to be documented somewhere, right? So it is known as this is terms deployment architectural perspective. So on slide 16, we have uh, such an example where we show the system state, the business logic and the client users separately. So it shows uh, what are the software that gets installed in the system the business logic, uh, the part on a server, and part on the client machines. So different clients might get different uh, software installed, right? Okay. Next, on slide 17, we describe the elements of software architecture. So software systems architecture typically is not a uniform monolith. So that means it's not uh, uh, everything in one big diagram, right? So it is not uniform. You, will, you can have different diagrams that show different aspects of the software architecture. So software systems architecture should be a 
composition and interplay of different elements right so you might have things about how the processing is done right then there will be details about the data right? also referred as information or state in uml diagrams we call it state right because you know if you take a variable and like depending on the variables value we call it state so if you take a you know object oriented concept so if a, there's a variable that can take a like there's an integer variable x if x is zero it's one state if x is one it's a different state so like that uh, then we have to show the interactions as well so when uh, two objects or two components interact with each other and one sends a message to another it invokes something in the other object so this is an interaction so let's go through one by one on slide 18 now uh, so what is components so components are elements that encapsulate processing and data in a system's architecture. Elements that encapsulate. So these are going in line with the object oriented concepts. So in a class in say Java, you will have all the data that you need, all the constants, the variables, right? And their values. And there will be the methods. Right, all encapsulated into one class. Right? So here the definition of component is a, a software component is an architectural entity that encapsulates a subset of the system's functionality and or data and it restricts access to that subset via an explicitly defined interface. So in object oriented, we have interfaces, right? You have the getter methods and setter methods that are public, and we have the variables that are private, right? So that's the interface. Right? Then uh, these software components has explicitly defined dependencies on its required execution context, right? There will be dependencies. You will need parameters to pass, uh, uh, to a certain method, right? Then there will be return values, right? So that kind of dependencies for something to execute. So to call a method, right? You cannot just invoke a method. If the method requires a certain parameter, say it requires a string to be input, you have to pass that string from the calling point of the program, right? So those are the dependencies that we are talking about here. So components typically provide application specific services. So these kind of components, which are kind of like the classes that you define, they provide application specific services. They provide the services for the application. Okay, like the methods that uh, make the processing. Then we have connectors. So in complex systems, interaction may become more important and challenging than the functionality of the individual components. So in big systems, distributed systems, uh, the interaction between the parts of the software components become more important than exactly how you have implemented the method or a class. Right? So here, the definition of software connector is an architectural building block tasked with effecting and regulating interactions among components. So these are connectors, like in a, say in a network, it might be the, the network topology, right? So that kind of connector aspect is also important. So in many software systems, connectors are, connectors are usually simple procedure calls for shared data accesses. So in uh, systems that run on the same machine, not on a distributed system, 
all the connectors are also there's a simple procedure calls okay one method one public method gets called from another class right so that is the connector but it becomes much more complex in real world distributed sophisticated software systems right then these connectors are typically provided application independent interaction facilities so these are more related to the hardware of your system so because of that is platform uh, they are about the platform mainly not application uh, dependent so we say that connectors typically provide application independent interaction facilities it doesn't matter what software you are running these are related to the facilities or the infrastructural decisions how your networking happens what kind of protocols are used so that kind of things so examples are in the simplest case is a procedure call connectors then there are shared memory connectors when you have multi file systems you are sharing information through uh, the memory and then message passing connectors right message passing from one class to another you send values through parameters then there are might be streaming connectors right when you are uh, having input from different uh, automated uh, devices you have streaming connectors then there might be distribution connectors right in a network infrastructure there might be components that distribute the packets coming from the server so we call them distribution connectors then there are wrappers or adapter connectors when you are dealing with different protocols you have to add header files to make the packets readable from the other system right so that kind of connectors are there okay then the third type of uh, things we have to show in the architecture now we talked about two things the components connectors and on slide 21 now uh, we have the configurations so we talked about components and connectors now to put them together components are the software parts connectors are more hardware related things right so these components and connectors are composed in a specific way in a given system's architecture to accomplish that system's objective now in order to accomplish that objective we have to configure them there is a certain correct configuration or a optimal configuration so an architectural configuration or topology is a set of specific associations between the components and connectors of a software systems architecture right so here we have to identify what is the best configuration and we call it the architectural configuration okay so it relates the components with the connectors in the architecture okay so on slide 22 we have a uh, example configuration uh, diagram it shows the different components like we have the smaller boxes showing decision module defensive strategy offensive strategy strategy analysis so these are the software components and it shows how the system is configured how the connection is happening right so you have a symmetric communication then there are some symmetric communication happening between the the troops managers right uh, so that kind of connections are also there and this diagram is showing how the total configuration is done okay. okay next up 
uh, we have architectural styles. So there are different ways we can choose an architecture. So there are certain design choices that regularly result in solutions with superior properties that lead to better software right, compared to other alternatives. Solutions such as these are more elegant, effective, efficient, dependable, evolvable, scalable, and so on. So we have all these good attributes of software. Okay, can be found, can be realized if we follow a good architecture. Right? So if you follow a good architecture, then your design choices are better. It will have better looking systems, more elegant right? and effective. It will precisely solve the problem. Efficient, right? do things quickly. Dependable, less crashes. Evolvable, you can accommodate a change later on easily. Scalable, you can scale it up to integrate more systems, more machines later on. So there'll be this kind of good uh, quality in your software if you follow architectural styles. Right? So an architectural style is defined as a named collection of architectural design decisions. So you prescribe certain list of design decisions and give it a name. So these are applicable in a given development context. So for specific business domains, you will have architectural styles, right? In a development context. And then these are constrained architectural design decisions that are specific to a particular system within that context. So within that given context, in that given business domain, you will have uh limitations on what you can do so it kinds of the if you're following architectural style your design options will be limited to the trusted or the tested uh options then the architectural style will elicit beneficial qualities in each resulting system it will elicit it will show we can prove right that beneficial qualities are there okay in the system so it uh, it can be used for proving the quality of your software uh, and make up the documentation as well okay. then we have the concept of architectural patterns now you have heard of design patterns in your previous courses right so in design patterns what did you do so you analyze and identify that a certain design pattern can be applied. Say iterative pattern or factory pattern, observer patterns, right? So uh, design patterns like that can be uh, inserted or applied in your design decisions to make up better design decisions. So architectural patterns are actually the same thing, but at a higher level. So we apply tried and tested patterns in architectural decision making. So an architectural patterns is a set of architectural design decisions that are applicable to a recurring design problem and parameterized to account for different software development contexts in which that problem appears. So you can select the tried and tested architecture and then parameterize like there will be variables that you have to choose. So just put the values to those parameters and then customize to your given problem and then you are sure that you are doing the best thing for the given context. So there are widely used patterns in modern distributed systems. So things like the three-tiered system pattern, right? I'm sure you all know, like we have a client server and a, a, a database, right? So that kind of three-tiered system can be applied for science, banking, e-commerce, reservation systems. So any type of system that 
requires that kind of three tire architecture we can just get a uh, architectural pattern that are architectural pattern books and customize for the uh, con required context so on slide 25 we have the three tired pattern so you have the front tire making the interfaces the UIs then the middle tire you have the business logic and in the back tire we have sometimes it might be a server or sometimes the same machine the back-end uh, database connections right? so front tire will contain the user interface functionality to access the system services and the middle tire contains applications major functionalities the business logics will happen in the middle tire where a lot of code is uh, all the methods the functions uh, are in the middle tire then the back tire contains the applications data access and storage functionality so it might be the database it might be some file system right everything we call the back tire Then uh, moving on to slide 26, architectural models. So architectural models, views and visualizations uh, are about how we show the model. So our architecture model is an artifact that document some or all of this architectural design decisions about a system. Okay, so, uh, like in UML, we have specific architectural diagrams that we will look at later on. Right? So we call them the models, right? Like class diagrams and uh, use case diagrams we have learned. Now our architecture models involve things like the tires and layer diagrams, okay, deployment diagrams. So we call them architecture model. And uh, then there are architecture visualizations, okay, are a way of depicting some or all of the architectural design decisions about a system to a stakeholder. An architecture visualization is a way of showing the architectural design decision to the stakeholders, the business owners, the uh, system users, and the software developers, every, everyone involved with the project will be able to look at the architectural visualization and get an idea. Now, all the stakeholders might not get the same visualization, which is like say the business owner will only get a high level architectural visualization, whereas the uh, developer the programmer will get more details about the architecture. Uh, then the, the architecture view is what each of these uh, stakeholders will see. So architecture view is a subset, subset of related architectural design decisions. So the business owner's architecture view will be different from uh, what the say the software developer will see. Uh, then the architectural processes that involve are architectural design, architecture modeling and visualization, architecture driven system analysis, you have to do system analysis that are driven by the uh, principal decisions, then architecture driven system implementation, architecture driven system deployment, runtime redeployment and mobility. Then architecture based design for non-functional properties, including security and trust, and architectural adaptation are also needed. Then the stakeholders in the system's architecture are the architects, definitely, and the developers, right? You know, stakeholders are people affected by the architecture, right? So the developers will be affected because they have to write the code to support the architecture. Right? to be to have faithful uh, code to the architecture then we have test engineers who are affected by the architecture managers customers users and even the software vendors 
get affected by the architecture because if, the, if it is a client server or a cloud based system the way you sell the software will be different from uh, if the software is available in cd right so uh, that's the lesson for today uh, and i have uploaded a assignment for you to complete at home based on what we have learned last week so please go through that assignment and submit uh, within uh, two weeks time. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can email or use the LMS to interact. Okay, thank you very much.